Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nishda Tsaturyan. I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. In this episode, we speak with Nessa Sohanyan, co-founder of High Tech, about the organization's recent trip to India and their efforts to connect the Armenian tech ecosystem with the rest of the world. We explore the different and exciting initiatives in the country around space tech, including the Bazum Space Research Lab, the Kemurjian Challenge, and the Armenian Model Rocketry Association. Thank you for listening. Nurses Jen, thank you so much for being here today. Of course. Um, Nurses, last year around this time, we published a sort of in-depth profile on high tech and some of the work you've been doing over the last 12 years now. I think a lot of our listeners might have already uh, read that, but for those who don't know, let's start with a little bit of your background. Tell us what high tech has been doing for the last decade. Yeah, thank you, Nishna. High Tech is a network of entrepreneurs and technologists that started in the Silicon Valley in 2011 uh, that has uh, spread across the United States. Uh, Armenia, Europe has roughly 700 plus individuals who have participated in these events or online communities, Um, uh, 200 uh, or so entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. at various stages as part of the network. And the primary purpose of the network has been to connect people. Uh, have them learn from each other, have them give each other ideas, find resources, and and build companies together over that course of time. Right. And it's really served as a bridge between the U.S. and Armenia in many ways. Over the last year or so, it seems like you guys have been taking on a little bit of a new format or maybe expanding some of the initiatives. Talk about what High Tech is doing today. Uh, you're right. A big function High Tech ended up serving was really connecting uh, U.S. and Armenian tech ecosystems primarily sort of Silicon Valley ecosystem uh, with uh, with that of Armenia. I would say at this point, the tech network, the Armenian tech network internationally is pretty connected already. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, you would see entrepreneurs from Armenia and California, entrepreneurs from California and Boston, entrepreneurs from Boston and Armenia, and it's, it's you know, it's almost difficult to figure out who lives where anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so I'd say that's a pretty big success in that to be in tech, you have to be international. And so uh, the phase that the network is in is that there are a number of later stage uh, startups, a number of later stage entrepreneurs who are facing uh, a very different set of challenges that I think the network faced, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, which is really around scaling, which is really around international expansion, and uh, the world is obviously getting far more connected as well, uh, and startup ecosystems are popping up all over the world, uh, and those that have been around for a long time are maturing and getting to a very different level as well. And so, uh, what we're really focusing on now in terms of how we build on the network that we have is twofold is how do we incorporate um, others into the network you know it, it was never an exclusively Armenian network but obviously predominantly um, a network based on the Armenian tech diaspora and the Armenian tech community in Armenia but we would like to obviously be more of a service to the rest of the world uh, in terms of our connectedness in terms of our ability to uh, find problem solutions find the right folks sort of o- almost anywhere in the world as a result, we've been really focusing on taking a similar format, which is taking uh, people from one region to the other, getting them to know each other, which was typically between the U.S. and Armenia or, or, or Europe, uh, and going to uh, tech ecosystems that are really relevant for the Armenian tech ecosystem, but we don't have necessarily deep relationships with yet. Uh, mm-hmm. And that includes uh, India, for example, that includes Israel, that includes uh, Estonia, that includes specific hubs in Europe. And so we, this year, what we started doing is um, actually planning uh, trips, uh, community building activities for our later stage entrepreneurs and then traveling to uh, to these destinations. And we've just completed a trip to India to do so. Um, and again, the approach is the same in that it is all based on uh, building personal connections, finding people who are like-minded, uh, have shared values, finding ways that we can help them, finding ways that we can get resources from the network that we're connecting to, um, and then through those personal relationships, then find what are the right business relationships mm-hmm. to build. This is kind of like a later stage EIP, if you will. Uh, yeah, EIP was an entrepreneurial immersion program uh, focused on earlier stage entrepreneurs and uh, the hypothesis there was uh, as you're starting to build your company, you know, you're in, when you're in idea stage, product market fit stage, there are a number of mistakes you're going to make and, and actually exposure to Silicon Valley is really critical mm-hmm. uh, for you to accelerate that learning. Uh, and the immersion program uh, took entrepreneurs primarily from Armenia, but not limited to, uh, from Europe and other places in the U.S., and took them to Silicon Valley for a 10-day program, Silicon Valley in Los Angeles, yeah. for a very 
in sort of intense immersion so that they get to see uh, and really understand and, and make conclusions for themselves and know what they need to pursue there. Um, in that same vein, this is really an immersion program for later stage entrepreneurs to kind of go explore, discover, yeah. understand, sort of have a feel for the place, the culture, the technology, the ways of working. So yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I hadn't even thought of it as a, a EIP yeah. for later stage <laughs> entrepreneurs, but effectively uh, what it has become. Right. Uh, you mentioned a number of ecosystems that you guys have outlined as the first ones to visit. When you're thinking about which ones to bring Armenian entrepreneurs to, but not necessarily only Armenian entrepreneurs, how do you evaluate which ecosystem is the right one to connect Armenia's ecosystem with? What are the metrics or what are you looking for there? At the beginning, I think there are certain more obvious low-hanging fruit. Uh, so I think that's, uh, but the criteria there tend to be, is it a mature ecosystem in some sense, right? In whatever vector, it could be talent, it could be specific um, niche technologies that are relevant. That's a really important criteria. And also how relevant um, do we think it is for the Armenian tech ecosystem? So how, how closely connected could it be? Mm -hmm. um, so regional physical location is yeah. certainly one aspect. So we're right now looking at, okay, what are the really relevant tech hubs that are physically close to Armenia? Mm -hmm. uh, because our ecosystem be between U.S. and Armenia is already strong. We believe by connecting to ecosystems that are physically closer to Armenia that uh, our ecosystem here can connect to, then uh, we can bring more value to the U.S. network. And also the U.S. network can bring more value to those other networks through Armenia mm. uh, because uh, of the physical uh, sort of proximity. So that's certainly a criteria there as well. Um, so to kind of give you the reason that uh, India was the first choice was the primary uh, topics we were thinking about were talent. And India is known for having invested for a long, long time, probably you know, 10, 20 years more than Armenia has had the opportunity to in its uh, technology sector, and not just in building technology, but also building a Silicon Valley culture around that technology. I think that's you know largely due to the uh, the Indian uh, expat or diaspora communities in Silicon Valley that have been doing right. the same work for you know for 30 years. Organizations like uh, Thai, the Indus Entrepreneurs, and many others have been doing this work. That was the criteria for choosing India. Sort of, okay, this is a mature uh, talent hub. If you kind of look at the top 10 tech hubs in the world, is India is absolutely is uh, in that list and you, uh, i guess you're also not just looking for tech hubs but like tech entrepreneurship hubs is that right or yes i think we, we are looking for hubs where there are entrepreneurship is either already really vibrant or is picking up right. in a major way because there's clearly a lot of places where technology is happening mm -hmm. but but for us it's really important that we're talking to entrepreneurs and startups right. as well and then the other criteria is are there technologies that we on the armenian tech ecosystem are trying to really build you know, towards or trying to build on from what we have and where the ecosystem we should be connecting to either to pass on our knowledge and sort of provide solutions in uh, or, you know, be able to connect to uh, world-class technology providers there so mm -hmm. that we can uh, be competitive as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, India is also very interesting in that perspective, uh, especially Hyderabad, where we went to. Uh, they're, uh, they're incredibly strong in, uh, in space technology, in aerospace, in healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. And so those were all very important uh, areas for the network. Before we dive deeper into the India trip specifically, as you're connecting with these hubs, you're also, in a sense, selling the Armenian ecosystem because you have to show them the value of connecting with Armenia, right? What's the, what's the pitch there? Part the of message? the goal with, with the trip is to actually figure out what the right message is, hmm. to actually really understand where is the value that we can provide. Obviously, we have some hypotheses. So one is, as a tech ecosystem here, we've had the fortunate disadvantage of never having to really build for a local market. And so the entire tech ecosystem here has developed thinking global market. And that primarily means U.S. market and European market. And the pitch to, for example, the ecosystem in India is let us be yet another avenue for you to be able to launch into the West, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's um, testing your, your products, whether it's having entrepreneurs be part of the Armenian ecosystem here and as a result get connected uh, more effectively um, with the U.S. and European ecosystems and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And that has resonated quite well. And then the other uh, pitch is Armenia is small, sort of similar 
you know, fortunate disadvantage in that uh, certain technologies, certain things can be implemented here, you know, almost countrywide, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, faster than maybe some cities <laughs> in, 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 in India, India. Yeah. right? And so for a country like India that's trying to develop incredible technology to support its society, mm-hmm. having a place where some of those things can be launched and shown to be effective can become uh, really useful for them to go back and and be implemented in a much wider sense. Mm. Um, You know, for example, in space technology, right, the infrastructure necessary in Armenia to make something happen is much smaller than than in India. Uh, And you can kind of show that uh, a technology that's developed in India could be influential globally. And you Mm -hmm. can do that by implementing that in a country like Armenia before exporting it out to even bigger places. So those are the two areas I think that that our pitch uh, has been sort of focused on. So take us through the India trip. Tell us about what you guys exactly were doing there. Actually, if you don't mind, let me just uh, add one more thing to the last question about going to India and sort of representing Armenia, right? Representing Mm -hmm. the Armenian ecosystem. It was really important that we're not going one or two or three people at a time. Right. It's really important that when you are, you know, going and exploring and and trying to connect, you're taking a large number of folks who are, uh, who clearly are dedicated to helping each other and helping, you know, their own community. And that shows only when you can see that group working together. And so that was one of the reasons why this isn't virtual. This is one of the reasons it's not just like identifying certain business opportunities and spending, sending specific people there. It's taking mature entrepreneurs who've had life experience, who've had, you know, who've built businesses, who have expertise, and then going to one location together to showcase sort of the variety of technologies, of use cases uh, that the ecosystem covers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that was also highly effective in sort of showing the connectedness of the Armenian network and that just because we're small doesn't mean we can't be impactful. Right. And that was actually quite clear uh, for us when we went to India. We had 16 entrepreneurs and ecosystem builders traveling. Uh, we also had some families with us as well because it was a community building sort of trip. It was a trip where we also got to, got to spend a lot of time together and exchange ideas and really got to relax and reset. So we went to Hyderabad and uh, Telangana. Telangana is one of the, I think, I believe it's the youngest state of India. It uh, only formed eight years ago or so, and Hyderabad being the capital, and they've been investing quite heavily in their technology infrastructure from the government, sort of top level, the beginning of the state that they had decided that technology was going to be their primary uh, focus. Is Uh, it one of India's larger tech hubs? uh, It is becoming one. Becoming one. Uh, It is clearly not aware, for example, the Bangalore tech ecosystem is, but in certain areas like defense space tech uh, and aerospace and uh, healthcare, uh, it is number one in India as well. Our discovery there was that a lot of the right investments uh, over the last you know five to ten years and have gone from having sort of very small tech ecosystem to having an incredibly vibrant tech ecosystem mm-hmm. and if that trajectory as that trajectory continues uh, it's likely going to be an incredibly important hub uh, in India and around the world mm-hmm. so we got to spend four days in in Hyderabad and then we traveled to sort of really understand India a little bit more and, and actually get to take the sights in and enjoy and get to know the culture and, and the people as well and, mm-hmm. and actually spend time with each other in a more serene place mm-hmm. as well so that was the the gist of the trip mm-hmm. Interesting. And were you guys meeting with like local startups and companies there? So the story of uh, why we chose to go to Hyderabad is because one of our uh, network members is the CEO and founder of Skyroot Aerospace, uh, which is a startup uh, based in Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. It is the first space tech company, private space tech company in India. Uh, It's the first space tech private company in India to work formally with uh, the Indian Space Research Organization. They are the fastest startup to have launched a rocket into space in the world. And uh, we had the pleasure of hosting them in Armenia a couple of years ago for a high-tech showcase. And as he got to see the Armenian ecosystem here and got to connect to the individuals here, as we were expressing our desire to go explore India at the time, uh, he invited us to go to, to Hyderabad. Uh, just because it was is where he is and he knows the ecosystem there and, and he really believes uh, that, that that's going to be a really core place to, to be in India. And so what we ended up um, having the pleasure of doing is connecting with his network when we were there. Um, he connected us with an organization called T-Hub, um, mm-hmm. which is a... A public-private established organization in Hyderabad, established by the Telangana government, that effectively facilitates 
the entire ecosystem. So uh, T-Hub is the largest uh, innovation campus in the world. It houses a a dozen or so organizations, including public-private ones, corporate incubators. There are incredible sort of um, structures, the largest prototyping facility in India, you know, the Novartis' campus is in the next door. Mm-hmm. It's a very big uh, location where they've, you know, they're really trying to, where they've been building this uh, technology ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they facilitated all of our introductions where we got to meet, I would say, the, the, inter- the full spectrum of the entrepreneurship and the technology ecosystem there from early stage founders to later stage founders to investors who advise their own startups to the CEOs or key individuals across all of these public-private organizations, things like organizations responsible for taking technology from universities and and making them... uh, Knowledge transfer. T-Works, for example, which is the prototyping facility, TSIC, which which deals with grassroots innovation, Mm -hmm. Rich, which which deals with taking sort of really coarse uh, technologies, um, uh, advanced technologies, and and, and really commercializing them, as well as multinationals, right? Mm -hmm. So we met with uh, Marutu Suzuki, which is Suzuki's Indian division. Um, It's a separate entity in India. It produces, I think, around roughly 80% of the cars that are driven in India. They have an innovation lab that they were very interested talking about, you know, finding out what technologies we have to offer that they could incorporate into their technology. Uh, Carillon, which is a healthcare company. So in the entire full spectrum of sort of what it takes to actually build a startup, mm-hmm. we got to have sessions with uh, entrepreneurs on go-to-market, you know, their, their experience of building startups and, and businesses, both technology businesses, but also traditional sort of packaged uh, goods, for example, healthcare product yeah. goods, cause really trying to understand the dynamics of India. And also sort of, we also got to meet delegations that came from like Australia, individuals who came from other parts of India, yeah. um, and really understood how they're trying to build their bridge with the world as well. Yeah, fantastic. One of the things that you even mentioned a couple of times in this uh, conversation so far is that uh, it's a space tech hub, um, and there's a sort of a focus on developing space technology. In Armenia, there's sort of a small, tiny little space tech ecosystem, it seems like, that's sort of developing. One of the players is Bazumk, which is a space tech research lab, uh, you could say. Then there's the Kemujian Youth Space Challenge. And recently, there's been some buzz about maybe some more initiatives launching uh, in that direction. I know you guys have an event in Glendale next week that will speak more about this. First, before we dive into some of these initiatives, maybe tell us, because I think a lot of people's minds might be, why is space tech important? Why is it relevant for Armenia? Why is this something we should be focused on? Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. It's, it's come up quite a bit because it, it's both futuristic and in some sense, right, it can appear. Like a luxury, why, does it, why does it matter? Yeah. And I think it's always a good question to be asking <laughs> anytime yeah. you're investing you know, your time into building ecosystems. I would say that I think about it in two ways. I think about it as what are the technologies that are going to continue to allow us to be com- competitive in the world moving forward? Mm-hmm. What, what are the economies developing in the world that we must be prepared to be part of uh, that, you know, whether today or tomorrow are going to become predominant te- uh, economies? And the space economy is an incredibly important one that's developing. It already exists. Right. Um, and it already, uh, and it do- does not require you to be physically connected mm-hmm. Like your geographic location is is not a barrier to go to space. Hmm. You can go to space anywhere in the world, right? So we we've had uh, the disadvantage in Armenia of being landlocked. Right. This is a vector in which we are it's only a, not locked. Right. Right. And so it's really important for us to understand where we can play a role in the space tech ecosystem. And it's such a huge ecosystem that there are many many roles to play uh, in space tech. So that's there. That's that's sort of the first criteria to say. Um, Let's invest in something that is actually going to ensure that we have a future. And when you say space economy, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean like like satellite launches or? It is a very large problem space, right? So even, you know, um, crop monitoring mm-hmm. right, is part of space technology. Right. Garbage collection is going to be part of space technology. Pro, you know, processing data, building new communication technologies between satellites, all of those things that are going to support the overall space sort of exploration or utilizing space for whether it's for material collection or for uh, supporting uh, things down on the ground 
uh, there are infrastructures that need to be built to support all of those things. So mm-hmm. it, it doesn't just have to be launching satellites. Right. You know, as these satellites are being launched, technologies are being developed on these satellites or on these CubeSats that are doing other functions. There's machine learning technologies. <laughs> there are communication technologies. There are imaging technologies that are being developed as part of the space tech ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So it can be a number of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's even you know blockchain processing technologies, etc. Right? So, so anything can be launched into space space can be processed and finding ways to add value to that as mm-hmm. it's growing and, and growing quite fast uh, is really important, I think, for us. I cut you off. You were about yeah. to say your second point there. The second point is, you know, when you look at space technology, you realize all the technologies that are that developed there are incredibly critical and supportive of other technologies that are crucial today. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said, agriculture, for example, right, is incredibly important for us to be able to monitor crops, understand weather conditions, uh, monitor events uh, that are happening, especially in remote regions of Armenia where it may not be always accessible. Communication technologies, control systems, uh, sort of aerospace across the board. So by developing a space tech ecosystem, you're also developing skill sets Mm -hmm. and technologies and underlying infrastructure that is critical to other technologies as well that we must be building also. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason we think SpaceX is so important for us as a community to really get behind because it allows us to bring in researchers and bring in knowledge into the ecosystem that is incredibly unique and incredibly applicable across the ecosystem. Right. What might first pop into people's heads when they think of space tech is like the traditional launches and things of that nature. What you're saying is that it doesn't end with the launch. Post-launch, there's a lot of things like developing applications based on the satellite tech that has been deployed, data analysis, things of that nature. There's a big sort of IoT space intersection being sort of developed. We spoke about that a little bit last year. When thinking about Armenia's role in that, how do you sort of see that starting? How do you see that blossoming? Because it would be hard to imagine rocket launching from Armenia anytime soon. So what would sort of be the first players and what would they be doing? The first phase is really learning the right. end-to-end, right? Really understanding how to take an idea, build it, and then put it into space. And that's really what uh, Bazum Space Research Lab has been really focusing on doing. Because as you build, for example, you start developing manufacturing capabilities, mm-hmm. um, you know, supply chain, understanding that, understanding how these devices operate. And you're absolutely right. It doesn't end with the space launches. In fact, um, space launches is only the beginning, right? It's right. just the gateway for you to get into space. Tech. Right. It is not right. space tech itself. Right. And space launches are becoming quite commoditized at this point. Right. So it's not necessary for you to be doing rocket launches for you to be fully involved in the, in right. the, in the ecosystem there. And so what Bosnik is doing is effectively putting a schedule in place that's sort of um, reliable and predictable such that you can take any idea that you may want to deploy, right. um, build it. Put it on us on a CubeSat and make sure it gets into space, and then you can experiment with it. And so, which applications we end up building, I think, are to be determined. I suspect highly that you know image processing uh, is going to be something really important, sort of monitoring, understanding uh, aspects of the world, and acting on it uh, is going to be really, really important. There's sort of incredible new. Uh, camera technologies that are being developed uh, that we can start potentially deploying and, and, and utilizing. There are inter-satellite communication technologies that are being developed. Um, you know, Armenia has an incredible strength, I think, across you know uh, other technologies, but in machine learning, mm-hmm. computer vision. You know, we have a lot of underlying unique technologies that have been developed here in Armenia. I suspect applying those in the space tech environment is probably where we'll probably see a lot of wins uh, mm-hmm. over a long period of time. But we're still at a point where we're discovering where right. where our unique advantage is going to have to be. Um, yeah, I guess an interesting way of thinking about it is that these launch companies that have popped up over the last few decades, the SpaceX's of the world, have kind of almost created a platform for other smaller ecosystems that don't have the capability to do launches to participate in, in the space economy, I guess you would say. You mentioned Bazum. I guess this is really the first avenue for Armenia to build some of that capacity. Tell us a little bit more about what Bazum is and what exactly the mission is there. Yeah, Bazum is a space research lab. So its its mission is similar to any research lab, which is to do groundbreaking research and enable uh, researchers to 
effectively conduct the research that they, give them shared infrastructures that they can conduct the research in space that they w- wish mm-hmm. to do. Right? That's the ultimate vision of Bazung was becoming uh, the place where new ideas can come and build and deploy it into space so that you don't have to take that whole idea from end to end yourself. Right. Right. It's to provide is to actually really learn how to take it from an idea phase into implementation and then having the network of potential partners to allow you to then take those ideas and then spin them off into startups after the fact, right? So that's really the idea is to become the platform for uh, startups and larger companies, hopefully in the future, to be able to utilize uh, the skill sets that they're helping their folks to develop to then build full-on products around. The ultimate vision is to generate startups Mm -hmm. that actually um, support world problems, but in its activities to actually take some of those ideas and then put them to the test, right? Actually build proof of concepts of these, of these, of these things in the future. Um, So that's really the the goal of of Basum. And and that means bringing researchers from around the world, uh, establishing uh, connections with uh, India, with uh, Austria, with the US, and um, and also sort of all of these platforms that exist, like the launch platforms, uh, SpaceX, um, uh, Skyroot Aerospace, to work out all of mm-hmm. the ways to work together so that utilizing the ecosystem that exists in the world becomes seamless right. for somebody yeah. who wants to go experiment in space. Mm-hmm. Can you shed some light on, in India, where there is a, a more of a growing space tech hub, as they've matured, what are some of the applications, some of the companies that have popped up? What's something that maybe in a longer roadmap for Armenia we can expect to see? While you guys were there, did you guys see any obvious opportunities for collaboration? Or yeah, absolutely. With- the unique advantage that the space uh, startups, space tech startups and aerospace startups right, right. That have in India is that they get to benefit from an incredible history of space exploration by India itself. Mm-hmm. The Indian Space Research Organization has built incredible infrastructure that supports these um, these startups. So even you know, Skyward Aerospace does its, does its launches off of uh, the ISRO uh, pad, right? So that, that allows them not to have to build a lot of the things themselves. Right. And so that's a huge advantage that they have. So you know, first and foremost, uh, in terms of opportunities for Armenia, uh, the more that we can actually connect with and make u- use of some of the infrastructure that the Indian Space Research Organization, India as a government, has built, that's already a huge opportunity mm-hmm. for us to accelerate our space uh, technology and aerospace technology. What was inspiring before even going to India is reading some of the literature from India about its ambition to democratize space, mm-hmm. meaning to make space available for others who may not have all the resources that, for example, they have or the U.S. has and, and other countries who can build all that infrastructure. So there's a desire to make this available uh, and obviously you have to do it the right way. There's an incredible amount of proprietary technology that gets developed to do that. Um, but their mission is to make sure that the world has access right. to this. Um, so that's sort of number one is sort of infrastructure support mm-hmm. in some way. And then in India, we saw it's just such a variety of technologies being developed around aerospace. So, you know, one incredibly exciting startup that we saw was just developing flight um, simulators. Um, flight. Again, flight yeah. simulators, right, for... Like 360 flight simulators, um, so that an, a pilot can actually simulate uh, being in an inverted plane, right, and going through all these transitions, and not be limited by you know only three degrees of motion. Uh, we saw technologies around, for example, incredibly small lens technologies to support you know image capture from space. Or again, it's not limited to space, but obviously space is a big target for that. So again, just uh, incredible hardware technologies uh, to support space tech, things that we can incorporate into our research, into our startups, into our sort of production line as we try to solve larger problems. Right? So we don't have to go and invent every single part of that chain there's incredible technologies that have been developed there that, you know, if we just add one piece of technology here, now we can do more with. There's a, a number of companies focusing on manufacturing, right? 3D printed engines and yeah. uh, testing equipment. You know, one of the things that's interesting for us is the, their uh, technologies are being built also to be very cost effective mm-hmm. because they have to build for such a large scale and their competitive advantage uh, from, let's say, the U.S. and Europe is cost as well, which is very beneficial for us because we also have to be very cost efficient as we build some of these technologies right. as well. Yeah, so I would say the thing that we can learn from the most and start to build on top of most is the manufacturing capabilities that India has, hmm. especially in this space. 
as I said, right, space tech being a supportive technology, manufacturing is something that's incredibly important, hardware manufacturing for, for Armenian tech. Hmm. And space tech forces you right. <laughs> to, to manufacture, to build things. And they have incredible capacity of manufacturing any and all parts of that and bring that in. But they also have incredible amount of data that they've already captured. Mm-hmm. A lot of their startups, or especially their, a lot of their infrastructure players have captured a lot of data that can give us the ability to start doing work and adding value without necessarily having to capture all that data ourselves. Right. So that's also another aspect. So manufacturing data and then specialized devices to then incorporate into our space tech offerings, I mm-hmm. would say, are the three areas that we, we should look at. Yeah. One of the stories that I think maybe has sort of gone, I don't know if unnoticed is the right word, but probably should have gotten more attention is I think, you know, as we saw the AI boom over the last, it's really, it's been a while, but really the hype over the last sort of six months, Armenian startups were able to really capitalize on a lot of that because a lot of that expertise was built up in the 10 years prior when that wasn't necessarily as exciting as it is today. So if, even though the, the space economy might not be where things like AI and other tech verticals are today, you know, it's great to be ready for it when in 10 maybe or even sooner it becomes a much more important aspect of the te- overall global tech ecosystem. That's really fantastic. I would actually say because AI is where it is right now, you know, it, it's hard to say, but a large percentage of problems that was going to take incredible amount of technology to support are becoming already supportable. Yeah. Right. So it's becoming a lot easier to build software. I mean, a lot easier. <laughs> It yeah. is, it's an understatement to say how much easier it's become to build software and to build solutions for the world. And so you also have to think about where can you build sustainable value? Because the, I think one of the excitements, but also one of the fears around AI is you might have an idea today, build it tomorrow, and the next day it's invalidated because you know the next lang- language learning model update just takes care of that problem by default right so this mm-hmm. entire thing you might have you know entire companies are now yeah irrelevant because you know you can solve that whole problem with a prompt yeah you can't do that in hardware at least right. not yet right. you can't do that you know so you really have to pick problems to solve that are defensible th- that are defensible yeah. right and space tech is actually I think, and to become one of those in aerospace and, and controls things, you know, things that deal with physics <laughs> yeah. are, are things that you just have to build. And in fact, AI just makes it incredibly easy for you to then build all the solutions within it. Yeah. But you have to be in a space where it can't just be disrupted by a software update somewhere, mm-hmm. which is effectively what, what's, be, what's happening. So, mm-hmm. you know, the point you made is incredibly valid. And I think we have to learn that lesson even more seriously now that uh, it's even not even about being ready for what's coming in 10 years. It's that, you know, once all the, let's say, lower order problems are solved <laughs> through ML, what's going to be left to solve? Right. Uh, and, and I think in the next few years, this is going to be yeah. um, you make you know, sure that the you're most there. important yeah. thing to be solving for. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Tell us about the Chemogen Youth Space Challenge. What is it? Yeah, this was just an opportunity that came up when founder of Skyroot, uh, Pawan uh, Chalandra, was uh, in uh, Armenia, you know, building the relationships with Bazum, uh, building relationships with the entrepreneur network here. And he opened the opportunity for us to put a device on a, on a test rocket, on a, on a rocket that they were launching into space. It's uh, going to go up and then come down. It was not a rocket that was going to launch a satellite. It was it's a precursor to that. It so happened that in India there was going to be some activities happening to, to have a device be built onto that, onto that rocket by uh, school kids there. And uh, he graciously offered to do the same for a device built in Armenia. And so Bazum High Tech came together, reached out to our entrepreneurship network, and uh, decided to launch the Kembojan Youth Space Challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kembojan is a Armenian scientist from the 60s and 70s, from the Soviet era. He had worked on the lunar land- lander and on the Mars lander. Uh, incredibly influential figure and uh, really as somebody who sort of gives us that pedigree <laughs> in, right. in, in space tech. Uh, it was his 100th anniversary. And so we hosted a competition for students, uh, youth in Armenia, to build uh, a device to go onto that rocket and to go into space. Again, this was all 
done by the community. The community came together. Bazungs organized the competition, supported the, the trainers and, and the, you know, the team leads. Uh, and a number of uh, teams from Yerevan community uh, participated, and the device was built. The group Ad Astra from IPE School won the competition, and then the Ad Astra team and the IS team uh, also collaborated to kind of incorporate some of the final stuff together, and 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 together submitted that device to mm-hmm. be sent into space. What did they build? Uh, they built a device that had a number of sensors on it, including an ozone sensor that could, you know, and also could test sort of its position in space as it went up into space and then came down. So this device was then uh, put into the rocket in November of last year, and and it was launched successfully, uh, went into space and came back. Um, it was two firsts. It was the first private rocket launch in India, and it was the first device that was built in Armenia to go to space. Oh, wow. Both happening together. And it was done by these students. It was done by these students. It was facilitated by the Space Research Lab, launched by a founder in our network in India. Right. So it all it was all people believing that it's really important for this to happen. It's really important to inspire kids to aspire to these things, uh, that it's that it's possible. If that doesn't prove to you that space is accessible. Right, that twelve-year-old kid in Armenia can build something and then see it go to space. Yeah, just I a few you meant university later. students. No, oh, wow. Okay, no. no. Wow, that's fantastic. It also really highlights the importance of these networks that you're building because putting aside where it starts from, but it requires both the network in India to be able to do, to facilitate the launch and the challenge, and then the students here that are are building it. That's fantastic. And not only not only is it showing that hey, kids can do this. Yeah, which is really important because now you know you can realistically say you know to to a teenager growing up in Armenia or anywhere in the world, hey, you should think about space. Yeah, like you should think about what you can do in space because you can. And in that process, you know, and and this is incredible thanks to the kids who came in and they didn't know what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Right, this was an out of the field, you know, just sort of okay. You know, is this real? <laughs> right. But let you know, they jumped in and they got really excited. They really worked incredibly hard on this. They had great ideas. They executed. But what they allowed us to do is a lot. They allowed us to actually execute a space launch end to end. That's really what happened. Yeah. Right. Two international organizations got to collaborate, put agreements in place, figure out their logistics, figure out their testing protocols, figure. You know, we learned a lot of lessons yeah. in that process. So. You know, not only do we get to help kids build do something cool, but they helped us mature our, um, our process. And so we can move much more quickly and more confidently in building bigger things. And this is where Bazum and Skyroot are work, talking to each other. Well, Bazum is also doing a launch with SpaceX soon. It Was gives Bazum us... involved in the satellite launch last year? You would have to ask Bazum there because all of the space tech labs and players collaborate and work with each other. So I believe so, but I can't tell you how. Because the satellite launch that happened last year was a satellite that was bought and then launched for Armenia. So that's an incredible accomplishment for the government. And I know we have worked with those entities in that process, uh, but I can't speak to more right. detail than that. Uh, I mean, what Bosum does is very large. Right. There's a lot of work that they're doing. And I, you know, with high tech, we just get to hyper focus on a few of the initiatives that right. they're pushing forward. So I, you know, I, I can't speak to the details of that. But they are specifically planning a CubeSat launch that they're building in Armenia. What's a CubeSat? Also. So CubeSat is, is a sort of a standard type of satellite. Mm-hmm. It's a small box that you get to get build as many of as you'd like. So you can get, take, you know, two, four, eight of them and big something big, or you can have a something small. The point of this CubeSat is that it can be placed in a rocket. Uh, it, it has interfaces with the rocket, so it knows what's happening as it's going up. When the rocket releases it, the satellite can then stay in space yeah. and then can communicate with the ground station. Mm. So that's what a CubeSat is. What goes into the CubeSat, the payload, can be sort of anything. Right. Um, so yeah, CubeSat is a, uh, is a pretty standard technology that's being used uh, across uh, mm-hmm. space tech. Fantastic. And then the sort of third little layer of the, this growing space tech ecosystem is the Armenian Model Rocketry Association, mm-hmm. which is an opportunity for kids' school to get involved with building model rockets and things of that nature. Does Bazum work with them in that? Absolutely. In that so the, both the Model Rocketry Association and Bazum were, I believe, founded by... 
the Armenian Aerospace Society. Mm, right, yeah. Um, so it's the same people doing both. So they're teaching kids how to, how to build mo- rockets. And so Model Rocket Society is an incredible initiative to kind of put the thought and the skill set of, of launching rockets. And again, just thinking about yeah. space and thinking about aerospace into the hands of of kids all around Armenia. And I'd say it's probably one of the most inspirational things that I've, I've seen uh, myself. And kids love it. Parents love it. Kids come back to it year over year over year. And we're with Bazum also looking at ways to scale that, tap our network for funding so that we can put that into as many as many cities and villages in our, across Armenia. Um, even connected with companies in India who produce uh, certain technologies for model rockets. So we're trying to also find, you know, best in class technologies to bring in and incorporate into the model rocket. So it's again another channel to bring in great technology here so that, you know, kids here don't always have to think about building everything themselves, but they can also think about accessing the resources that they have around the world and build cooler and cooler things. Yeah. There's a student that I tutor here who is a part of the Model Rocketry Association, and he's preparing to like apply to aerospace engineering programs and stuff in the U.S. now. And it's so cool to see every week when he comes and talks about like what they've been doing and stuff, and, like 3D printing these parts for rockets and stuff. The inspiration and like the the motivation to continue it is so so obvious. Uh, it's a really fantastic initiative. And thanks for saying that because yeah. it it proves the very first point, the question you asked about why space, right? right? Like. A kid has to learn 3D printing yeah, absolutely. to do model rocketry because they're thinking about space. But in that process, they learn 3D printing, <laughs> which is going to be applicable in so many areas of their life. So, and just general engineering, right? Yeah, general like, engineering. Yeah. General yeah. engineering. My background is mathematics, aerospace engineering, yeah. and mechanical engineering. And I've been a computer scientist professionally for the last 20 yeah, years. Yeah, it's kind and of I like a tell you, back for you, right? Yeah, there's a different <laughs> skill set in yeah. building hard engineering. It's an incredible skill set of building software. I mean, it's an entirely different compl- complexity. It's a different type of complexity. But it is a skill set that's really important to have. And I think the world is pointing us in the direction of harder engineering in the future. Uh, And so this is really building up that capacity for us as a country. It's fantastic. This is our last question. We sort of have this traditional question where we ask about the future. Where do you hope to see this small but growing initiatives in space tech in five to 10 years, let's say? In five years, I hope that we as a nation have a vision for ourselves around space. Mm -hmm. I personally have a vision that there's going to be an Armenian city on Mars someday doesn't mean that there's Armenian on that city. That city is run by our Armenian network okay. <laughs> and becomes another way that we get to connect the world and service the world. Right. So I think for us to see a vision for ourselves as a people, as a nation, that goes beyond today and our current struggles is, is something that I hope to see for us in five years, sort of a mental shift of where we can be. But that needs to be supported <laughs> by some real things. And I would like to see in, in five years, especially around space tech, that we actually have unicorn startups in Armenia in space tech. That's a minimum requirement for us to be able to say we provide worldwide value in space tech. So I, I definitely see that as a place that I'd like to see in the future. And that means having enough infrastructure in Armenia around space tech, aerospace and defense technologies, including cybersecurity, sort of all of that, and it is connected, to be able to have an idea, build a prototype, commercialize it and scale it, all by utilizing the Armenian infrastructure here. Yeah. And it's connected in infrastructure globally, but relying on infrastructure here. Yeah. That's my hope for the next five years. Let's hope to see it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nessus. Thank you, Mr.